the preclinical animal model data was so compelling that it has inspired, not from our lab, from other investigators, you know, looking at this too, uh, a dozens of clinical trials that are ongoing right now. If you just go to clinicaltrials.gov and Google uh, and just or just type in ketone supplement, I think you get like 30 or 40 clinical trials that are looking at ketone supplements. And just a few years ago, there was none, right? So uh, there's a lot of other people instead of us uh, looking at this idea of, I guess you could call it a ketogenic diet in a drug, but I think of exogenous ketones are calorie containing molecules that are essentially in some ways found in nature. Some of them are, some of them aren't. But they do elevate a bioidentical uh, ketone bodies in the blood and in tissues. So in many ways, they're not so much like a drug, but they are, it's like creatine monohydrate, right? So you can take, creatine is found in meat and it's found in other things, and you we can create, we can take exogenous creatine and it has not only an effect on skeletal muscle, but on the brain. And I think we're getting an appreciation for creatine as uh, like a, a nootropic even. So. I think I look at I look at ketones as being kind of the next creatine, but it, it's going to take a while for the research. I think there's like 700 or more trials or studies on creatine, you know, showing the efficacy and the positive effect. Whereas maybe there's uh, maybe like 50 to 100 with with ketones, but it's it's expanding very rapidly. So it, it's very nascent literature. Uh, but the nascent literature has spawned many other labs, you know, outside of our lab and labs that were doing it well before our lab, you know. Uh, but I became so interested in this idea that it, I just changed my whole research direction away from drugs to look at diet and supplements. Yeah. If um, I know Sorry, you, that was long-winded. No, it's, like, yeah. it's, it's, it's fantastic. So much information. Um, you mentioned that, you know, in different contexts, these different types of ketone supplements can have, you know, varying effects or be used for different things. Um, mm. If you're just looking at ketone, you know, beta-hydroxybutyrate levels as a endpoint, what would be the difference in taking a ketone ester versus a ketone salt? Um, how long would you see an increase in the, you know, beta-hydroxybutyrate mm -hmm. levels? Is how transient? Mm -hmm. um, is it side effects-wise, you know, yeah. with, with these different... And the formulations as well, like yep. you know, there's all kinds of formulations that you see. Yeah. So you can get an elevation of ketones for one hour or six to eight hours, depending on the formulation and depending upon if you took the ketone supplement with on an empty stomach or taken it with food uh, or combined, for example, uh, a ketone ester with a ketone electrolyte salt, right? If you take... Uh, ketone salts and you combine it with medium chain triglycerides, the fat delays gastric absorption and pushes the pharmacokinetic curve, if you will, to the right. So you get, uh, and, and this is important, you get a slower, a little bit slower elevation of blood ketones, and then you have uh, a significant sustainment of hyperketonemia over time. And the decrease in the spike, so a very rapid spike in ketones, contributes to a release in insulin. So if you consume uh, a ketone ester at, at a large dose uh, on an empty stomach, you have a very large increase in beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate too, depending on the formulation. And it's that rate of change, the relative rate of change of metabolites, similar to like uh, if you have a very rapid, you know, relative spike in leucine, it's going to kick on skeletal muscle protein synthesis. But if it's a gradual spike, maybe it won't kick on the metabolic machinery associated with skeletal muscle protein synthesis. The, the, the rapid elevation of ketones can produce a counter-regulatory effect, which is a release in insulin. And then that can shut down your own natural ketone production. So the way to go about doing it is to formulate something that causes a predictable but gradual rise in ketones and sustains that for a period of time and has a predictable uh, decrease over time. So the way to do that simply is to take uh, the way that I do it on a daily basis is beta-hydroxybutyrate that's bound to electrolytes, sodium, 
uh, that has sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium in that formulation. So balanced electrolytes, more or less like the electrolyte supplements that are on the market. So Element is one, I think maybe Liquid IV or Gatorade or even these things. So the higher sodium, you know, but you want to match it with some potassium, calcium, magnesium. And then the electrolytes in and of themselves will actually delay gastric absorption a little bit. So salt does that. And if you combine that with MCT too, that could that delay it. But ketone salts, the salts can actually delay gastric absorption. So it's not so much of a rapid rise. If you take a beta hydroxybutyrate ester, you have 1,3-butanediol typically is bound to beta hydroxybutyrate. When you consume that, the beta hydroxybutyrate is quickly liberated, so it spikes your glucose or your uh, your ketones up very high. But in regards to glucose, actually that comes down pretty low. And you had asked me that question: Why does uh, why does glucose drop so down into hypoglycemic ranges with a single large dose, like thirty to fifty milliliters of like a pure ketone ester, something like that, right? Yeah, so. In the beginning, I thought it was insulin, and it is insulin. So the threshold for me, at least, and I I measure insulin quite often in response to this, and what I find is that if you take a ketone supplement and it boosts you one to two millimolar, like a delta, a change, an increase, then the elevation of insulin is almost imperceptible according to like the assays that we're using. But if you were to consume a ketone ester and get up into the three, four, and five range, then that produces an elevation of insulin equivalent to uh, eating, you know, drinking like two or two to four ounces of OJ or like 10 grapes or like a small orange, right? So for me, it goes from like three to six to six or eight or 10, right? Or um, the insulin, my, my blood insulin levels. And it's equivalent to maybe eating about 30 or 40 grams of protein. So you would get that amount. Whereas if you consume, you know, keto start or another uh, exogenous ketone supplement and you consume it like 10 grams of BHB, pure BHB, and you get that elevation of about 1.5 millimolar. Is that a full packet of keto start? Uh, keto starts about, it's kind of like double, like almost like double dosed in a way. So I usually do half a packet right. and then. Which is uh, I'm drinking right now, right? Yeah. Yep. So consuming a, a full packet, typically I get about 1.5 millimolar. So I feel the effect, but uh, I've actually consumed two packets and I start to get a bump in insulin, but one packet, no. And the bump in insulin is relatively small, probably because the mineral load is delaying you know, the absorption into the system a little bit. Uh, so I think that's, that's really important because we know like insulin suppression is also important for uh, the anti-seizure effects. So we think that a reduction in glycolysis uh, is therapeutically part of the scenario of the anti-seizure effect of the ketogenic diet because 2-deoxyglucose has a pretty strong anti-seizure effect and that is being advocated and used clinically in some studies as the ketogenic diet in a drug, so a glycolytic inhibitor, 2-deoxyglucose. So you consume this drug, and it's like 25 milligrams per kilogram. And if you go higher than that, then it becomes cardiotoxic. So it's not an ideal approach, but it inhibits the glycolytic pathway in a way that sort of mimics effects of the ketogenic diet. And uh, so when we increase insulin, insulin stimulates glycolysis. And I think that that could be a negative thing in the context of maybe cancer or seizures or other things that we're interested in therapeutically managing. So I, I view there's the ketogenic diet and exogenous ketones, and they're not mutually exclusive, but I actually think they're synergistically when they're, you know, when they're combined together. So if you follow a more liberal version of the ketogenic diet, like a modified Atkins diet or modified ketogenic diet or low glycemic index therapy, which is like a one-to-one ketogenic diet, and then supplement ketones on top of that, then I think what you have, in my opinion, is an optimized ketogenic diet for lifestyle, but also, and it needs to be this needs to be studied and, and validated in clinical trials, but I think it would also be optimal for epilepsy, for cancer, for managing type 2 diabetes, and also for weight loss. So the ketones have a satiating effect on the brain. 
So the ketones are alternative energy substrate. And when your brain is metabolizing ketones and it actually experiences low glucose, it doesn't go into an energetic crisis. So it's not signaling that you need to, to eat. And I think that's, that's really interesting. There have been cases where uh, you could produce a hypoglycemic shock that would be fatal, otherwise fatal. But if your ketones are elevated, you're asymptomatic for hypoglycemia. So that's a remarkable example of the, of the effects of ketones on preserving, maintaining brain energy metabolism. And that has real world effects in the context of everyday living. And if you go on a diet, you inadvertently need to go into a calorie deficit. So calories do matter <laughs> for one thing, and you have to achieve and maintain a protracted calorie deficit to uh, to lose weight and tend to some extent uh, sustain that weight for a period of time, then you can go back to a more eucaloric ketogenic diet or eucaloric diet. But that's you, it will necessitate like low glucose, low insulin, and you're going to get hungry. But if your ketones are elevated, that's where ketones shine. They really shine in the context of calorie restriction or an energy deficit because you have a better fuel flow to the brain in that context, right? So if you're on a, on a low calorie diet that's producing a state of hypoglycemia, but your ketones are not elevated, that's going to be a painful diet to adhere to and sustain. Right. <laughs> um, what's the- Not fun. No, um, and it, it's funny, like I absolutely um, noticed that when I was doing my ketogenic diet, I was, like I said, I was doing a lot more inter intermittent fasting and it was a lot easier to do. I mean, yep. you do feel satiated. I felt satiated. But, and this kind of gets into another topic and I, I, I did want to kind of ask you about um, the difference between, you mentioned the diester for yeah. ketone esters, but there's yeah. also monoester, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, is there a difference in terms of efficacy? Uh, if you're just looking, I mean, if you're just kind of wanting to elevate your ketone levels. And again, it seems as though I prefer, like I've done, I've tried um, all these different types of ketone supplements. And um, I personally am not a huge fan of the really quick spike. And then mm -hmm. like crash, like to me, it's kind of crashing because um, my glucose levels get so low. Yep. And then when the ketones wear off, it's like, where's my energy? <laughs> you know? So you have, yeah hypoglycemia and hypoketonemia, and you might also be kicking yourself out of ketosis. So uh, it could be a dose thing. Uh, the 1,3-butanediol beta-hydroxybutyrate monoester that was developed by, in, in part by Dr. Richard Veach, and that was one of the first ketone esters that we actually, you know, I became interested in, and it did not have anti-seizure effects. So uh, I kind of, I didn't lose enthusiasm because I knew there was so many other molecules that could be developed. So what, we worked on a couple different molecules and the next one was a diester.Ually, first we had the monoester. 1,3-butanediol acetoacetate monoester had very strong anti-seizure effects. And then we could do more of a transesterification reaction is just more or less a stoichiometric reaction where you just add more uh, ketones, in this case acetoacetate, to 1,3-butanediol. So it's 1,3-butanediol which gets metabolized in the liver completely pretty much to beta-hydroxybutyrate. That molecule with a, uh, a reaction we can add to acetoacetate molecules. And, you know, both of these things, the monoester and the diet, they, they taste nasty. They taste like, like gas. Uh, but they have very distinctly different effects, uh, at least in the context of the anti-seizure effects. So when we developed the, the ketone diester and we used that in our animal model of tonic-clonic seizures, which was, uh, in this case, uh, high-pressure oxygen, but we then tested it in various other seizure model, models too. Uh, it had a very strong anti-seizure neuroprotective effect. And then if we use 1,3-butanediol or any other uh, ketone, it didn't really have that profound anti-seizure effects.